I'm Roger Holcomb, and I've gone to family church a lot of years. I've gone through a lot of quite a few hurts, um, or at least the perception of hurts. I have really struggled the last six years. Um, I went through a divorce. There's been some bumps along the way with in the relationships with a couple of my children. Um, it's been it's been a train wreck for me. It's been really hard. I was stuck. It was it was just robbing me um, of life, emotionally, physically, spiritually. I was tired of it. And that's when I decided to attempt this restoration class again, because I, I, I knew I needed to move on. I went through it, or attempted to go through it about five years ago, and I did not like the class. Um, I dropped out. Um, I was not ready to do the work and to deal with, with some of the emotions and feelings I had. The class really helped me realize my identity is in Christ. It's not in what the world, who the world sees me as, who Satan tells me I am. It's my identity is in Christ. God loves me even though I'm broken. And he, um, he restores us and that's his business. He's in the restoration business and I just see people differently. I see the world differently, I see God differently, all as a result of, of what I've been through. And it's hurt in my forgiveness. It's a daily thing for me to um, entrust that bitterness to God and give it to Him. Um, but it's very freeing that I don't have to, to carry that because it's, it's more than I can handle. My life was a train wreck, but God is in the restoration business. What a great statement that we are working through things, and all of our stories are a little bit different, but I hope you're hearing two things very, very clearly. One is that everybody deals with brokenness of different kinds, and that part of the process of healing starts with admitting it, acknowledging, yeah, I am broken. And the second thing I hope you're hearing is nobody is too broken that God can't heal. And sometimes we get all of our pile of broken pieces together and we think this is hopeless. And the cool part is it's never hopeless with God. He's been restoring people for a long time. And we're going we're gonna to look at a character from the Old Testament named Saul. And we're going to look at some snapshots of his life and see part of the problem was that he was looking at the wrong things to give him a picture of himself. How many of you looked in a mirror this morning? Mirrors are rude, are they not? <laughs> I mean, there's no softening of anything, it's just that's how it is. And, and so you go to a hall of mirrors and you see mirrors like this. And when you look at funny mirrors, you look funny. And here's the theme this weekend. If you look at a broken mirror, you'll have a broken life. And you know, we, we see ourselves, as Roger said, by how other people see us, by what our parents said about us, by, by the successes or failures. And there are so much going on in everybody's head about how they see themselves. And most of it's not accurate. Most of it, particularly from God's point of view, is not accurate. And you know, I, I had a little reminder of that myself. I, I was up here at the Sutherland campus playing the bass last week, and you know, I haven't played for a while, they hadn't got that far down in the barrel to need me up here, and uh, I was playing bass, and by the third service, I knew the songs, and I was just enjoying myself, and you know, I felt like I was about 25, I could feel the wind blowing in my hair. <laughs> and then a dear friend said, you know, she wanted me to know that she was watching with, uh, with her boyfriend online, and so she sent me a snapshot of me playing bass. And I thought, who's that old bald guy? <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it funny that the picture in your head is different than the picture in the mirror? And if you think mirrors are rude, you ought to try being on video. Oh, yeah. And, and as I was looking for kind of odd mirror shots, I saw this one, and I thought, 
Here's the deeper problem. She's trying to stand crooked so her image will look straight. How much time do we spend trying to distort our lives so that our image is good? Because how you see the world, there's so often so much you can't even see how you see yourself because it's too close. And part of what we need to do is to look back and see some of the characters of Scripture and hear some of the stories that are shared and say, oh, that's me. That's me. So I want to start us with the character of Saul, son of Kish, who lived 1,000 years before Jesus, 3,000 years ago. And I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory, and we're not going to try to tell his whole story. I'm just going to take two snapshots of his life, and I want to show you two broken mirrors that Saul was looking in, and because he saw himself in a distorted way, he lived a distorted life. So the backstory starts with Moses had led the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They had gone 40 years through the desert wandering. Moses handed off to Joshua. They conquered the land of Canaan. They had settled down as a nation. And then there was this cycle of judges. Those were leaders that came up, that God raised up. They often had a military victory. They led the country for 30, 40 years until they died. And, and Israel was kind of going in a downward spiral. Every, every judge seemed to be a little worse. In fact, Samson was one of the judges. That gives you kind of a good picture. And so finally they came to Samuel, who was the prophet and judge at the end. And he was a godly man who led the people well. And when he came to the end of his, he was 80 years old, he said, I want to hand it off to my sons. And the nation said, no way. You may have been a godly man, but you were a lousy father because those kids are crooks. And so they said, we want a king like the nations around us. We want to be like everybody else. We want to have a king. And God wasn't happy about it, but he said, okay, I'll give you a king. And the man he chooses is Saul. And the story is actually kind of humorous if you want to read the whole thing in 1 Samuel 9 and 10. But Saul is oblivious. God is talking to Samuel and telling him that he's going to choose a king. And in fact, he gives him some very specifics. Saul is told by his dad that he needs to go find some lost donkeys. So Saul is a farmer. His dad says, you're 30 years old now, you and the servant, you go find these donkeys that are lost. And he wanders around for three days, going about 20 different, 20 miles in a big circle, and he can't find the donkeys. And so his servant has this bright idea. He says, well, in the town ahead of us, in Ramah, there is a prophet, or they call him a seer, a seer. And he said, I've got a quarter shekel of silver. Maybe if we go pay the man of God, he can tell us where our donkeys are. I think my job is weird sometimes, but I don't know if that's what a prophet thought his job was. But they were going to try to ask him. And so Saul comes into this thing completely sideways. He doesn't know what's going on. He has nothing more to to do than to find donkeys. And, uh, And there's another big story going on because God is at work behind the scenes. And God has a plan for Saul. So, 1 Samuel 9, I'm going to start reading in verse 14. So they went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming down toward them on his way to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the land of the, Philist- the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, their cry has reached me. So when Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, this is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. And Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and said, can you please tell me where the house of the seer is? I am the seer, Samuel said. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will send you on the way and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them, they have been found." And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Would that interrupt a conversation? What are you talking about? Saul says, I'm coming to look for these donkeys. And and Samuel says to him, you're going to come today and you're going to eat with me at this banquet. And oh, by the way, the donkeys that were lost, 
They've already been found. And Saul, looking at his servant, saying, donkeys? Did you tell him about the donkeys? How does he know about the donkeys? And so this like weird moment, and then he says, the desire of all Israel has turned to you. And Saul says, you must have the wrong guy. Because the mirror that Saul was looking through or looking at, and the mirror that many people look through or look at, is I am unworthy. I can't be that person. And let me give you a whole bunch of reasons why. And, and first of all, he starts with, you got to understand where I came from. And so he says, am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? Is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribes of Benjamin? Why would you say such a thing to me? That's fancy stuff for you don't know who I am, where I came from, and I can't possibly be the right guy. And so he goes back and he kind of reviews, no way this could be me. And you know, I think of my own life, and for a period of time we, we lived in Green River, Utah, and when kids say they, they live in a town where there's nothing to do, I say we lived in a town of less than 1,000, 60 miles from the nearest town out in the middle of the desert. Yeah, you had to make your own entertainment there for sure. But I was, I was from a poor family. I was the only, the, the preacher's son of the only Protestant church in a heavily Mormon community. And my perception of myself was, I'm an outsider, I'm a nerd, I am unable to do anything. I have no influence. And you know, God loves to take people who think they got no reason for him to choose them. And, and Saul goes back and he says, man, my family roots, you wouldn't believe what I came from. And then I think you see in Saul's response what many people have, and that is the labels on their heads. All the way through your life, people are sticking labels on you. <laughs> Saul was probably thinking, look at me, I'm just a donkey chaser. I'm just a farmer. I'm, I'm just a nobody. And I think whether you realize it or not, as you grew up through your home, people stuck labels on you. Maybe they were good labels, maybe they were bad labels. But I have talked to people 40 years later who said, my dad said to me, you're never going to amount to anything. And they spend the rest of their life trying to tear that label off. And if you don't get it from your family of origin, you'll get it in junior high for sure. You know you have a big nose. No, thank you for pointing that out. I didn't realize that. And that harsh, critical establishment starts, we, we listen to other people and we begin to believe that that's the truth. And so then he says, that if you understood who I am, where I came from, if, if you understood that I don't have any great abilities, you wouldn't choose me. In fact, I'll tell you how bad this gets. This is funny because Saul takes him to this, or Samuel takes him to this big banquet gives him the big choice piece of meat that's the, for the guest of honor. And when he leaves town the next day, Samuel takes a, a vial of oil and pours it over his head and anoints him because he tells him, you're going to be the next king. And there's this great moment you think would be this epic life-changing. In fact, he tells him exactly what's going to happen in his day, and the Spirit of God comes on Saul, and we have no clearer description in the Old Testament of God coming into somebody's life and, and showing his plan for them. And you know what he does after that? He goes back to the farm. And then they have a big need for a military uh, captain, a military leader. And Saul steps up. And you see, God was calling Saul to a very, very hard thing. The Philistines had so dominated the nation of Israel that, listen carefully, in the whole nation they had two swords. Two. Because they had confiscated them all and they'd shut down all the blacksmiths and they even had to go down to Philistia to get their plowshares sharpened. And they were absolutely dominated. So when God was saying, I want you to be the king, he was calling Saul to an impossible task. And you know, I, I hope you get this skill that as you read the Bible, you begin to say, this reminds me of another place. You think back to the Gideon, who was a judge shortly before this time, and God called him, and he's like, no, no, you got the wrong guy. I can't do it. And he gave God a whole bunch of reasons why. And then we roll back a little further, and you think, wait, wasn't that what Moses said? 
And see, God was calling all of them to these huge tasks, and they were thinking, oh, no, no, that's not me. And it gets so bad that when Saul wins this military victory, and they call all the children of Israel together at Mizpah, and they're going to have this coronation ceremony, and when it comes time for him to come up in the ceremony, and they're going to put the crown on his head, you know where he is? Hiding. It says, where is Saul? And the answer is, hiding among the baggage. How's that for an auspicious beginning to a reign? We can't find him. He's hiding. The king is hiding. And I want to question you. I want to, I want to ask you, do you look at this mirror where you think of yourself as unworthy? Because when God calls you, he doesn't call you to a man-sized or a human-sized vision. He calls you to a God-sized vision. So God has more in mind for your life than you think is possible. And if you don't feel a little overwhelmed, you're not listening. And we have all the excuses. You don't understand the family I came from. You don't understand the shame that I carry. You don't understand what I've done in the past. You don't understand how you can't possibly want me. And so my question for you is, where are you hiding in the baggage? Where is it that God said, I have a plan? Not not that you're going to stand out and be this stellar leader, but God has called the body of Christ to change the world. And together we can work as a team if everybody does their part. But what happens if so many people are going, well, it's not me, it's too big, I can't do it. And God's work goes undone. That's what happens. Or God calls somebody else. So that's the first mirror that you see in Saul's life is, I can't do this, I'm not worthy, I'm not qualified. And fortunately, I hope you've heard that phrase that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. He takes people. In fact, have you noticed in the Bible, he loves to take people who are very, very ordinary, and he loves to say, watch what I can do. Why? Because if he took somebody that was all together, they would think they should get the credit. When he takes somebody like us, people go, I know that had to be God, because I know them. You know, it's just, yeah, not them. It's God. And God gets the glory. So, the first perspective is the unworthy perspective, the first mirror he's looking at. The second one, we're going to take a snapshot from much later in his life. He's been king for 15 years now, and sadly enough, his heart has moved farther and farther away from God. In fact, if you compare King Saul and King David, you think David did a lot worse stuff than Saul did. But Saul is the one that got rejected as king and disqualified, and the secret is is his heart had turned away from God. You see, what often changes is, first of all, inside before it ever changes in our activities. And so, we see him a little bit later in chapter 15. And what's happened is that God has given him a specific painful assignment, that there's an evil group of people called the Amalekites who had attacked the Israelites when they were very vulnerable. And God says it's time for judgment, and it's time for them to be wiped out. So, he gave that assignment to Saul through Samuel, and Saul went out and he kept all the best stuff for himself. So here's how this plays out. I'm going to read in verse, chapter 15, verse 12. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel, which is a big mountain. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. Excuse me, the king is busy making a statue for himself. Does this look like a little different picture of Saul? This isn't Saul hiding in the baggage. This is now like, I'm the man. Everybody look at me. And you know, ironically, I think it's probably hiding the same insecurity underneath. It's the same problem, just a different way of looking at it, a different way it shows up. And so... Samuel goes on down and he meets Saul and Saul says, the Lord bless you, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. And Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep I hear and what's the lowing of the cattle? And Saul said, well, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Not our God, but your God. And we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. 
Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until they've wiped, you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord, and why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? This is an opposite-looking mirror, but I think it comes out of the same roots. This is the selfish perspective. And here we see that King Saul still feels the same insecurity, but now he is looking at how do I get people to admire me and how do I hang on to the things that God has given me as gifts because I'm going to get my life from them. That life is about me, it's about my possessions, and it's about what people think of, think of me. And so it starts with a focus on what people think. How will other people see me? And so Samuel says God has taken the kingdom and he's going to give it to somebody else. And he starts walking away and Saul grabs his robe and the robe tears and Saul is left holding a piece of it as Samuel walks away. And Samuel turns around and he says, in the same way, God is going to rip the kingdom out of your hands. Whoa. What would you think his response would be? He should have fallen on his face and repented and been sorrowful and broken. He should have understood that what God gave him, God could take away. But you know what he says? He says, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Again, distancing himself. So Samuel went back with Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. He says, yeah, yeah, I've blown it, but come and make it look good with the elders. Have you noticed when you watch these fail videos that when people walk into metal posts or when they do something really dumb, what's the first thing you do after that? <laughs> you look around and see who noticed, right? Who, who saw you? Who caught you? Because this is all of us. We're so worried about what people think. My mom used to say you would worry less about what people think if you realized how seldomly they think about you. But Saul is focused on his image. He's focused on how he looks to others. He's, he's focused on what do people say about me? Why? Because he's lost his center. He's lost his heart for God. And now he's trying desperately to get it from the world around him. Does that sound like a common problem? Yeah. Many people are trying to get their life from other people or from things. And because of that, we come to a sense of false ownership. Our picture is, I've bought these things, I've worked for them, I have my home, I have my car, I have my job, I have my health, I have my children, and I own them. And that's a dangerous broken mirror. Because anything you think you have, you can quickly lose. And if it's the basis for your happiness, your happiness will be destroyed. And so Saul begins to cling. He clings to what people think, and then he takes what God has given him as the kingship, and he grabs onto it. See, he didn't want to be the king to start with, but now he's the king, and that's his identity, and that's what he lives for. And when you live for something that you can't control, you are always at the whim of that, whatever happens with that thing. And so God had told him, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you, and I'm going to give it to somebody else. And he found out shortly thereafter, after the David and Goliath story and a few other things, that, that God had in fact chosen David to be the king after him. And so what did Saul try to do? He tried to kill him. And there's this amazing parallel, this amazing contrast, I guess, between David, who was now appointed the new king of Israel, and he had an opportunity twice to kill Saul when he was, his guard was down. One time he was back in his cave of En Gedi, and he could have killed him, but instead he just cut off a piece of his robe. And after they were out of the cave and David was up on top, he said, look, I could have killed you. And in a moment of lucidity, moment of clarity, 
Saul says, you are righteous and I am not. And God has given you the kingdom. In fact, he says, give me, swear an oath that you won't kill all my descendants. And then you think, okay, maybe he's getting it. Maybe he's surrendering. No, he spends the next almost 15 years trying to kill David. And David says, I will not kill the Lord's anointed. And Saul says, I'm spending every bit of my time trying to kill God's anointed. Because God had given him the kingship, but God said, now I'm taking it back. Is that God's right to do? See, there's that line in Job that haunts us. It says, God gives and God what? Takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. We like the first half. We don't like the the next part, do we? But I'll tell you this. God knows that things, we start out owning things and then they come to own us. And if you grasp onto them, it becomes an idol that God will wrestle you out of. And so God's desire and hope for us is that we can take the wonderful gifts that he gives us and we can say, okay, God, I receive this from you for the time that I have it. And if you give it to me, I'm going to use it as a steward for you. I'm going to serve you with it. And if you take it away, it may be painful, but I'm still going to worship you because life comes from you, not from it or from them. And you see, I don't know about you, but this is a constant battle for me, that things begin to come and take over my heart, and I care way too much about what people think about me. And I get too involved. Have you ever noticed that the more stuff you have, the more time it takes to take care of all your stuff? Yeah, then you have to find places to store your stuff, and you have to keep it from rusting and keep it from breaking, and yeah. The thing that we think will give us life exhausts us. And God's perception is that he's given us things that are good and he wants us us to use them for him, not to own them. In fact, the biblical mirror says that I have bought you not with things like silver and gold, I've bought your life with the precious blood of Jesus. And that when we come to Christ, we actually give him our life. We belong to him. So everything we have belongs to whom? To God. And we need that reminder because our fingers start grasping so quickly, don't they? And we cling to our reputation and we cling to our health and we cling to all kinds of things, thinking that they will give us life and they never will. So I would ask you that question too. What is it you're hanging on to? And I'll give you a warning If you begin to grasp on things, God will begin to grab them. He may not take them away from you. He may just shake them until you go, okay, you're sorry. I know who that belongs to again. I remember. And it's a searing process. So what's God's perspective on all this? You know what, God calls both of these where I am feeling unworthy and where I think that I can't do anything and where I think I'm the man and I'm going to take over. God calls it selfish ambition. And if you read the list of sins in the New Testament, selfish ambition is right in there with sexual immorality and murder and all kinds of awful things. And we think, selfish ambition? That doesn't sound that bad. That's kind of American. But you know what selfish ambition is? It's when I put my interests and my possessions ahead of what God wants. When I begin to take center stage, when I begin to build a monument for myself. And I want to give you another little picture from the New Testament. We looked at Saul. We looked at what he was like before he became a king and then how he clung to that kingship and insecurity. And now I want to move to the New Testament to a guy named, oh, Saul. Only this is Saul of Tarsus. He lived during the time of Jesus and after. And he was the persecutor turned apostle. And I want to give you two snapshots from his life. If he could have told you what he was like before he came to Christ, it's put in this passage here. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, 
I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, there should be like a drum roll behind this, don't you think? Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of, oh, isn't that an interesting parallel? Another Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, and he says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. See, Saul started, Saul of son of Kish, started being small in his own eyes, and then he gained this idea that he had all the rights instead of letting God control his life, and his life ended in destruction. Saul of Tarsus started the opposite way. He was a student of Gamaliel. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He knew all of the scriptures. He was brilliant and eloquent, and he was zealous. And what's the mirror he looked in? My, but I look fine. And then he says later, after he has a come to Jesus moment, he says, you know what really was true about me then? Let me tell you the new perspective. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. You see, he looked in the mirror and he saw somebody who was really righteous. And now he looks back through the lens of Christ and he says, you know, I was a blasphemer. I took God's name in vain. There was no more serious sin for a Jewish person. I was a persecutor. I stood and held the coats of the people that stoned the first martyr. And I was a violent man. I hauled people and put them in jail. I was a destroyer. I thought I was all that. But the reality is I was broken. And I couldn't even see it. And what happens is Christ comes into his life. And you see the the tone of his statement. He says, I am so grateful And then he says, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured on me abundantly along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. What a different tone. Why? Now he's saying, oh yeah, I was a mess, but look at what God has done in my life. And he's given me the privilege of serving. You can hear his open hand. And so Paul started... Saul started as though he was really, really impressed with himself, and he ends up with this humility, and God lifts his life up and makes a huge difference in in all of our lives. So one started small and ended in destruction. One started so full of himself, and he ended up so useful and so beautiful and so surrendered. And in James, he says... Where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. I think why this selfishness is such a problem is it's because it's the foundation for so many other sins. When I'm all out to try to make my life for myself, it leads to all kinds of sinful things. And then he says, but the wisdom that comes from above is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere. And as I was reading that, I thought, isn't this the gold that shows in the cracks? That from those broken places where God has healed us, he then makes us compassionate and considerate and submissive. We're not out trying to make a name for ourselves. We're out trying to say, God, whatever you want to do with my life, you can do it. And selfish ambition goes away. And Christ-centeredness becomes who we really are. Not just on Sundays, not just when we're on a mission trip, but in the daily walk of our life. I'm going to ask a a couple of questions, but before that I want to release to Green, and Pastor Will is going to walk through it with the campus down there. Love you guys. Let me ask you a couple questions. I hope you've been wrestling with this already, but As you look at your life, as you look at the the places where you're broken and where God wants to fill in with with his beauty, what's what's the place where you need to see God picture of you? Maybe you've got too high a view of yourself. Maybe you've got too low a view of yourself. Scripture says we're to look at ourselves with sober judgment, to look carefully. What gifts has God given me? What abilities do I have? What is God invested in me? What weaknesses do I have? What brokenness do I have? 
See, I hope through this series we're coming to have a statement like Rogers said, I know that I'm broken, but I know that I'm loved. I know that I'm a mess, but I know God has a plan for me. He's going to do something even through this mess. And I encourage you to embrace that. And then lastly, is there something that you're clinging on to? Is there something you've come to grasp? Your fingers have curled around, and now it's your identity, your life. And we're going to share communion today, and we're going to remember that Christ gave his life so that we could have life. And as we do that, I want you to say, Lord, I surrender my life to you again. I'm going to pry open my grasping fingers, and I'm going to give it back to you and let you work in me however you want to. Father, thank you for these pictures that are so pertinent to our lives, so powerful in what we need to see you change. And we are broken, but God, you have loved us. The cross is such an indication, not only of your love for us, but of how you can take the broken pieces and make them whole. And as we celebrate and remember, as we come with our broken pieces, I ask that you would give us faith to believe that you can do great things and that you'd help us to look in the mirror of the scripture and see what is true and who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.